Good evening, God bless you, and welcome to Calvary Grace. This is our evening service, and we appreciate you signing on. I pray that it's a blessing for you. If you are looking for our information, you'll always find the latest at calvary-grace.com. Calvary-grace.com. That is a website that is independent of YouTube and uh, independent of everybody else. It's just strictly our website. And since you're on YouTube or Facebook, uh, please give us a like. It helps us in the algorithm. And guess what? It doesn't hurt you at all. It doesn't cost you anything. And it makes you a good person. Will you bow your heads with me? Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we love you, we praise you, we honor you. And again, I ask that you would just bring your word to life. Let it touch the hearts and the minds of these people that are listening to this. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bibles and turn to Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. The church in Colossae. So then, just as you received Christ as Lord, or Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in faith, as you were taught, overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophies which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. This is something that I've seen a great deal in church life. People are taken captive, led away and led astray by all kinds of things that they see on the internet philosophies and principles that are based not on Scripture, not on the Word of God, not on what the Lord says, but on what this doctor says, on what that individual says. And there are many people that just find themselves folded into one conspiracy after another. In some cases, it's pretty harmless stuff. But I've known of people to go into tremendous depressions and suffer with tremendous anxiety over things that were purely based on speculation, <coughs> guesswork, and had nothing to do with what God has said he'll do for his people. I still believe that he is the protector of the believer that he loves us, that he cares for us, that he makes a way for us, Amen. and that we can depend on him. Now, there is always going to be the naysayers. There are always going to be the anti-faith people. I, I, you know, I, 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 I grew up in somewhat of a contentious state with my dad in certain areas. My dad was very um, against science and against doctors and against medicine. And I was very pro-science, pro-doctors, pro-medicine. I was also very young. The older I've gotten, the less I am inclined to believe in the science and the less I'm inclined to believe in the various professions. And I'll tell you why. What I have discovered and what you have no doubt discovered is that settled science is not settled science. I can find as many doctors online that recommend one thing and then as many doctors that recommend the upper, opposite thing. If you want to see this in action, pick a diet, any diet you want, type it into YouTube, and you'll get opinions on both sides. 
and from very professional, very high up, very educated, very documented people. One will say it'll kill you and another will say it's the only way to survive. And you just realize that all of the stuff we thought was settled and agreed on and the, and the bottom line is not. And they just don't know. There are so many things I'm discovering that they don't know. For a number of years, we had a doctor in our church here, a very precious woman. And she told me, she said, you know, we know less than 10% about the human body. I was stunned. I really thought they had it all down. They know every nerve, every muscle, every fiber, every organ, and yet less than 10%. Why is it one person can take an aspirin and do fine, another person will drop dead taking aspirin? Why is it one person has an allergy to this and another person doesn't? It would, it, there's just less and less settled science every day. And then once you get a report that comes out from a, the scientific community, the next question is, who paid for it? Who paid for it? And you just start to realize that you need to depend on the Lord. Amen. You need to come back to what is settled, what is dependable. What is our foundation? What is the thing on which we can stand? I'm being very cautious about what I say here because I know full well that YouTube will pull the file and or put a warning up underneath it, which they still may do. But I'm trying not to say too much. I'm hoping that you're smart enough to read between the lines. Take your Bibles, turn to 2 Kings chapter 18. 2 Kings chapter 18. In the third year of Hoshea, son of Ellen, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, of Judah, began to reign. Now, there's so much here in just this little phrasing. First of all, at this stage and at this time, Israel is not one country any longer. They have been divided into the two southern tribes and the northern tribes. The northern tribes go very pagan, and they're called Israel. The southern tribes around Jerusalem are called Judah. And so you have two kings ruling in what we would today consider one nation, Israel. The third year of Hosea, or Shia, son of Elkan, the king of Israel, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz of Judah, began to reign. Now, there used to be a, a theory that who your parents were dictated what sins were passed on to you and that you had to repent for your sins and for your parents and grandparents and so on. It is absolute nonsense, by the way. All sin is dealt with at the cross, period. But here we have Hezekiah. Let's just call him what he is, good king Hezekiah. Son of bad king Ahaz. Now Ahaz is the king who marries Jezebel. She brings to the table, literally to her table, 400 prophets, prophets of Baal, and she feeds them every day. Incidentally, the prophet of God is going to execute those individuals. It's going to be quite something. It says he was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah. 
the daughter of Zechariah. Now what we're learning here is that he is not the son of Jezebel. His mother's name, by the way, or his name means Jehovah is my strength. His, mother na his mother's uh, name is, uh, my father is Jehovah. And their, his grandfather's name is Jehovah remembers. So we're dealing here with a godly line that comes down, believe it or not, from Ahaz, one of the worst kings that will ever exist. By the way, the worst king that would exist would be Manasseh. That's the king that comes after Hezekiah. And there's no exam at the end, so don't worry. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. This is Hezekiah. Just as his father David had done. Now, it just simply means not that he's literal father, but he's in the line of David. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, cut down the Ashtaroth poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses made uh, <coughs> for the time... Uh, pardon me. For up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. It's called Neshustan. Now, here's what's happening. Good King Hezekiah comes into power. And when he comes into power, he decides he's going to clean up Israel and bring it back to the worship of the one true God, the thing that his father failed to do. His father being married to Jezebel, brought in all kinds of idol worship and wicked things were happening under his control. Finally, what will happen here is he will go through and he will bring down the Ashtaroth poles. By the way, you can still see images of them. They're called maypoles. It's a current image of an Ashtaroth pole. Sacred stones. These were altars which were put up to the various gods. He broke into pieces the bronze snake that Moses put up. Remember the story of Moses erecting the snake in the desert and those that looked lived. Well, they turned that thing into a god. By the way, men will turn anything they can and everything they can into a god. And so, shamefully, shamefully for us, he came along and he destroyed these things. I say shamefully because it would have been a remarkable thing to have in a museum. But again, people would still be worshiping it, and he did exactly the right thing. Hezekiah trusted the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. That's quite a statement. There was no one like him in all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He is the pinnacle of the kings of Judah, next to David himself. He held fast to the Lord and did not cease to follow him. He kept the commands of the Lord. The Lord had given Moses, and the Lord uh, was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and didn't serve him. Now, this probably wasn't the wisest move. The Assyrians were some of the most brutal, murdering people in ancient times. I don't think it's necessary to go into details, but they were utterly heartless, brutal murderers. They used terrorism like nobody has ever used terrorism. Wicked to the core and to poke the bear probably wasn't the smartest thing I had an interesting occasion some years ago we sat down to dinner in a restaurant and we actually had to get seated with other people at this particular restaurant and it wasn't uh, wasn't the most comfortable circumstance and so uh, you know you sort of make conversation as best you can and I began to talk to the people at the table, and they, they had their own language, and there was clearly there was something different about them. And so just as, as by way of making conversation, I asked them where they were from. They said, well, we're from all over the place. I said, that's interesting. You speak the same language. Yes, we're Assyrian. I said, you're Assyrian. You mean from Syria? No, not Syria, Assyrian. And you're speaking what? We speak Assyrian. 
well, what country is Assyria? They said, we have no country. God took our country away from us. They knew full well that they had offended the living God and that God had removed them from their country and never again did Assyria exist when God destroyed it. From watchtower to fortified city, he defeated the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory. In King Hezekiah's fourth year, which was the seventh year of Hosiah, uh, Hosea, son of Elan, king of Israel, Shalemanser, the king of Assyria, marched against Sir, uh, uh, Samaria and laid siege to it. At the end of the three years, uh, the Assyrians took it again, or took it. So Samaria was captured in Hezekiah's sixth year, which was the ninth year of Hosea, king of Israel. The king of Assyria deported Israel to Assyria and settled them in Halia, in Gozan, on the Habor River, in the towns of the Medes. What's happening here? The king of Assyria has decided to break the will of these Jews in the northern ten tribes. And he figures out that the best thing to do is to break their culture by moving them out of their country, putting them in other countries, making them intermarry, and break their, their power. And so that's what he does. He moves them out into Samaria, or from Samaria, which is where you get the present-day Samaritans. This happened because they had not obeyed the Lord their God, but had violated the covenant. Now remember, again I said there's Israel, and Judah, he's dealing with Israel right now. All that Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. They neither listened to the commands nor carried them out. In the 14th year of the king, uh, king Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. So now the story moves to Judah. They've already taken under the earlier king, they have taken... Israel itself, and now they're closing in on Judah, the tiny little area in Israel where Jerusalem is located. And so as they begin to come in and they begin to surround and begin to take it over, it says in the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. So Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent this message to the king of Assyria at Lachesh. I, I, I've done wrong. Withdraw from me, and I will pay whatever you demand of me. So he's going to try and make peace. He's going to say, listen, okay, I, I, I messed up here. Sorry, very sorry. If you back off, take your army and go home, we'll pay you whatever you want. The king of Assyria exacted from Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver, and 30 talents of gold. In simple English, that's about 11 tons of silver and a ton of gold, a metric ton of gold. So Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found on, in the temple of the Lord and in the treasuries of the royal palace. At this time, Hezekiah, king of Judah, stripped off the gold of which had covered the doors and the doorposts of the temple of the Lord and gave it to the king of Assyria. So such a heavy burden was laid on them, such a punishing burden. Imagine a ton of gold and 11 tons of silver. They had to go through the most beautiful building that had ever existed. This was the building built by Solomon, a remarkable, spectacular building beautiful on a level that I can't even describe and strip the gold and the silver out of it to pay the debt to the king of Assyria. By the way, you know this isn't going to go well for the king of Assyria. The king of Assyria sent the supreme commander, his chief officer, and his field commander with a large army from Lachesh to the king of Hezekiah at Jerusalem. And they came up to Jerusalem and they stopped at the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the water washerman's field. And they called for the king. And Elkiah, son of Helkiah, 
uh, uh, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, Joab, uh, uh, jo yeah, Joab, the, the son of Asaph, the recorder, went out to them. And the commander said to them, tell Hezekiah, this is what the great king of Assyria says. On what basis are you basing, or what, what are you basing this confidence of yours? You say, you have a strategy and military strength, but you speak only empty words. On whom are you depending that you rebel against me? Look now, you're depending on Egypt, by the way. They had just defeated Egypt. The Assyrians had just defeated Egypt and nobody knew it. That splintered reed of a staff, which pierces a man's hand and wounds him as he leans on it. Such is the Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who depend on him. If you say to me, we're depending on the Lord our God. Isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before this altar in Jerusalem? So here's what he's doing. He's twisting what was done. Hezekiah comes along and he removes all of the pagan worship out of Israel. Pardon me, out of Judah. And once he removed it out of Judah, they're coming along and saying, well, those, were the, uh, those altars were unto the true God. And, and now that they've been removed, you realize that Hezekiah has ticked off the real true God. And said, you must worship here in the temple. Come now. Make a bargain with my master, king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can put riders on them. Come on now. Let's, let's see reason. You can just see this. People without faith hate people that stand in faith. And they want you to see reason rather than take a faith stance. Come on. If you make a bargain with us, we'll give you 2,000 horses. You probably don't even have riders to go on them. How can you repulse one officer of the least of my master's officials, even though you're depending on Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Furthermore, I've come to attack and destroy this place without a word. Uh, furthermore, have I come to attack and destroy this place without a word from the Lord? The Lord himself told me to march against this country and to destroy it. Now they're flat out lying. Now what they're saying is, you know, uh, we've been sent down here by your God. Your God told us we should come here and destroy this place. You're depending on your God? Well, you know what Hezekiah did. He took down all of his altars. He didn't, by the way. He took down all of his altars, and uh, we're depending, uh, you're depending on this God, and, and yet this God is the one that actually set us down here, weapons in hand to, to kill all of you and to destroy this place. Then Alkayim, son of Hilkiah, and Shebna and Joab said to the field commander, please speak to your servants in Aramaic, Aramaic since we understand it. Don't speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people on the wall. What's he saying? He said, listen, uh, we, we who are standing here speak Aramaic. You, use that language. Don't use Hebrew because you're just going to terrify the people that are up here watching all of this. But the commander replied, was it only to your master that you and my master sent me to say these things? And not to the men sitting on the wall, who, like you, have to eat their own filth and drink their own urine. Then the commander stood and called out in Hebrew, Hear the, the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He cannot deliver you from my hand. So what they're doing is this. 
Now the enemy has come, he's standing there, and he is taunting them in their own language so that they will be clearly understanding it. They've been asked to speak in a language that the masses of people didn't understand, but instead they're going to speak in the, in the native accepted language of Hebrew, and they're going to make sure that all the people are terrified. They are masters of terrorism. I'm holding back telling you what they actually did to prisoners. It was just absolutely horrific. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says, the Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hands of the king of Assyria. How many times have people come along and said to you, your faith is useless, it's futile, it's stupid. It's a phase. Get over it. You can't trust in a God you can't see. You people believing that your God is coming back. It's been 2,000 plus years. He hasn't come back. You can't depend on, 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 on the so-called God. And here's Hezekiah telling the people to stand firm. Hold still. God will deliver us. The king of uh, Assyria will not take this city. Don't listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me and come out to me. Then every one of you will eat from his own vine and drink uh, and, and fig tree and drink water from his own cistern. If you come out, if you make peace, by the way, they tried to make peace in the beginning. He ended up exacting that huge price of 11 tons of silver and a ton of pure gold. And by the way, in those days, it was pure gold, not the 14 carat we carry around but pure, pure gold, and that didn't satisfy them. So they know full well, if they were to come out of that city, they would be butchered. But the promise is, look, if you come out, if you make peace with us, boy, I'll tell you, it, it will go good for you. You'll be handsomely paid. You'll be wonderfully looked after. And this is the way the devil does it. He lies. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He is a liar and the father of lies. When he lies, he speaks his native language. It means that he lies so well, you can't hear an accent. You can't tell that he's lying. And that's exactly what's going on here. This commander has come out on behalf of the, of the king of Assyria, and he is lying so well. Until I come and take you to a, uh, pardon me, until I come and take you to a land of your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and of honey. Choose life, not death. Come on, you guys, think reasonably here. Choose life and not death. I'll put you back into your homes. I'll look after you and care for you, provide for you. You won't be starving. You'll have absolutely everything you need. And then we're going to come, we're going to take you and move you to another country, like they did earlier on with the rest of Israel when they moved them to Samaria or the Samaritans out, pardon me, moved them from Samaria. Choose life, not death. Do not listen to Hezekiah. For he is misleading you when he says, the Lord will deliver us. Has any God ever delivered his, his, his hand? Pardon me, has any God ever delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria. You see, they were used to dealing with pagan gods, and every city had their own gods. Every group, every nation had their own gods. And some of them, by the way, had genuine occultic power. But the devil will not rise up against the devil, a house divided against itself. So he would give into the hand of the king of Assyria all of these smaller pagan groups. And so now this commander is emboldened to stand there and say, listen, no God has ever delivered anybody from our hand. Trust me. Don't listen to Hezekiah, your, your king. He's crazy. He's going to tell you that, you know, God is going to protect you. God's going to defend you. God's this, God's that, God's the other thing. 
God sent us here. Your God sent us here. Arms and weapons in hand. You better not trust in him. I'm telling you, we are physical, we are real, we're standing here, and you're trusting in some sort of spirit? How ridiculous. How stupid. We're the gods of Hamath and Arphad. Where are the gods of the Sephirvim? Hena and Eva. Have they rescued Samaria from my hand? Who of all the gods of these countries has been able to save his land from me? How then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand? By the way, big mistake. Never taunt the Lord God of Israel and specifically never taunt him as it relates to Jerusalem. But the people remained silent and said nothing in reply because the king had commanded them, do not answer him. You know, sometimes there's great wisdom in not being pulled into a stupid argument. Amen. Sometimes there is tremendous wisdom in not answering. Now, I believe that we have to study the word of God to give every man an answer. Yes. But there are times when you realize you are just being tugged into a war that is not real. I, I, I sat down many years ago with a young man. He worked in a restaurant that I was going to and so did his girlfriend. And I think he thought perhaps that I was after his girlfriend. I most certainly was not. I was after her soul. And I began to talk to her about the things of the Lord. And finally he came over and he said, I am an evolutionist. And I said, oh, that's good. Sit down. He wasn't ready for that, but he did. And he began to quote this doctor and that doctor and the other doctor. And I began to bat it back at him just as fast as he could throw it at me. I threw it back at him. And finally, I came to a point where I said to him, what would convince you? He said, nothing. And so I pointed out to him that he had a religion and a faith, and so did I. And his faith and religion was atheism, and his faith was in the fact that there is no God, and that evolution was the creator. He didn't like that, and he got up and left the table. We'd actually arranged to meet again because I was going to bring some documentation, which I did bring the next time, and he never showed up. Sometimes you need to cut it short, cut it off, and realize that some people are so dyed in the wool that they will not give their heart to the Lord. But the people remained silent and said nothing in reply because the king had commanded, do not answer him. Then Elkiah, son of uh, uh, Hilkiah, pardon me, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and Job, the son of Asaph, the recorder, went to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him what the field commander had said. Some years ago, I had the I can't say joy, but the experience of going to a Jewish funeral. And I take funerals, so I found it very interesting to be in a funeral that I was not taking and to see some things that I understood very clearly from the Bible. Incidentally, I spoke to the rabbi. They didn't understand why they were doing what they were doing, and I did. And I think he got a little annoyed with me when I quoted chapter and verse to him. But one of the things that they did is that on the way into the funeral, everybody was given a tiny piece of material, about two inches square. And then they were given a safety pin. And they would safety pin the material onto their outfit. 
And at a given point during the funeral, when they felt like they were being overcome with emotion, they would tear the material. And here's exactly where it comes from. In 2 Kings chapter 19, we read this. When King Hezekiah heard this, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and went into the temple of the Lord. This was a common way for the ancients to express that they were grieving. They would actually tear their clothes. Well, today, the moderns don't want to tear their clothes, but they want you to know they're grieving. So the way that they're going to make that public to you is that they're going to tear a little piece of material on here. Other things were done at that ceremony, which were very interesting, but that's for another time. He sent Elkayim, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and the leading priests, all wearing sackcloth, to the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos. And they told him, this is what Hezekiah says. This day is the day of distress and rebuke and disgrace as the children come to the point of birth and there is no strength to deliver them. It may be that the Lord your God will hear all the words of the field commander whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to ridicule the living God and that he will rebuke him for the words, uh, uh, the, words the Lord your God heard Therefore pray for the remnant that it survives. And King Hezekiah's officials came to Isaiah. And Isaiah said to them, tell your master, this is what the Lord says, do not be afraid of what you have heard. Those words which the underlings of the king of Assyria have, blas with, have blasphemed me, listen, I'm going to put such a spirit in him that when he hears a certain report, he will return to his own country and I will have... I will have him cut down by the sword. So now they go to Isaiah, and Isaiah begins to prophesy. He said, listen, don't you worry about what you've heard. Don't you worry about those naysayers. Don't you worry about those that would come against your faith. Don't you come worry about those that would try to defeat your, your, your stance of faith. Stand in faith. Stand strong. Yeah. Don't be weakened by what you've heard. Don't be shaken by what you've heard. When the field commander heard the king of Assyria had left Lakesh, he withdrew and found the king fighting in Libna. Now Sennacherib received a report that Turah, the Cushite uh, king of Egypt, was marching out to fight against him. And so again, he sent messengers to Hezekiah with this word. Say to Hezekiah, the king of Judah, do not let the God you depend on deceive you. Uh, when he says, Jerusalem will not be handed over to the king of Assyria, surely you have heard what the king of Assyria has done to all the countries, destroying them completely. And you will, uh, and you will be delivered? Did the gods of the nations they were destroyed by my forefathers, deliver them. The gods of Gozan, Haran, Rezaf, and the people of Eden who were in Tel Azur. Where is the king of Hamath and the king of Arphad, the king of the city of Zervedim, or of Hina and Liva? Hezekiah received a letter from the messengers and read it. And he went up to the temple and spread out before the Lord. All, uh, pardon me, and Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. You know, here's, an, here's a great thing. Hezekiah gets this tremendously negative letter mocking him, mocking his faith, mocking his stance before the Lord. And he takes the letter and he spreads it out before the Lord. And he begins to pray. And we have his prayer. O Lord God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over the kingdoms of the earth. You've made heaven and earth. 
Give ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to the words of Sennacherib as sent to the insult the living God. It is true, O Lord, that the Assyrians have laid waste to these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods at all, only wood and stone fashioned by men's hands. Now, O Lord, our God, deliver us from the hand of the all the king, from, from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. If you're following along, take your Bibles and turn to Second Chronicles chapter 32. Second Chronicles chapter 32. In 2 Chronicles chapter 32, it says this. After that, Hezekiah had done so faith for faithfully done. Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came to invade Judah. So D-Day came. It came the point where he came to invade. He laid siege to the fortified cities, thinking to conquer them for himself, when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come and he intended to make war on Jerusalem. He consulted with his officials and his military staff about blocking up the water of the springs outside the city and they helped him. By the way, all of that work that they did, Hezekiah's tunnel is still there to this day. They decided that they were going to build a way for the water to come into the city of Jerusalem and not be outside so that when the army came to surround them, that army would not have water. A large force of men assembled and they blocked all the springs and the streams that flowed through the land. Why should the kings of Assyria come and find plenty of water, they said. Then he worked hard repairing the broken sections of the wall and building towers on it. And he built another wall outside the one that was reinforced and supporting the terraces of the city of David. He also made large numbers of weapons and shields and he appointed military officers over the people and assembled them before him in the square of the city and the gate and counted him uh, and encouraged them with these words, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria. The vast army with him and the vast army with him, for there is a greater power with us than with him. With him is only the army of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us to fight our battles. And the people gained confidence from what Hezekiah, the king of Judah, said. Now jump back real quickly to 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 20. Then Isaiah, son of Amos, sent messengers to Hezekiah. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I have heard your prayer concerning Sennacherib, king of Assyria. This is the word of the Lord has spoken against him. The virgin daughter of Zion despises you and mocks you. The daughter of Jerusalem tosses her head at you. In other words, he's saying, you know, the pretty little girls in town here, they are laughing at you. You, you think you're a something, you think you've killed everybody and only, uh, you know, you've, your terrorism has, has affected us. Even the little, pretty little girls are just sneering at you. Who is you have insulted and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted your eyes in pride? Against the Holy One of Israel. By your messengers, you have heaped insults on the Lord. You have said, with my, with my many chariots, I, will ascend, I have ascended the heights of the mountains, the uttermost heights of Lebanon. I have cut down the tallest cedars, the choicest pines. I have reached the remotest parts, the finest of the forests. I have dug wells in foreign lands and drunk the water there. And with the soles of my feet, I have dried up the streams of Egypt. In other words, he's saying, I am so mighty. I'm so great, I'm so wonderful, 
that I can even just stand in the Nile and it stops up. Have you not heard long ago? I ordained it. In the days of old, I planned it. Now I have bought to, to, to pass that you have turned the fortified cities into piles of stone, their people drained of power, are dismayed and put to shame. They are like plants in the field, like tender shoots, like grass sprouting on the roof, scorched before it grows up. But I know where you stay and when you come and when you go and how you rage against me. This is God speaking. I know how you rage against me. Boy, I have met people that just rage against the living God. Because you rage against me and your insolence has reached my ears. I have put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth and I will make you return by the way you came. And this will be a sign to you, O Hezekiah. This year you'll eat what grows by itself and in the second year what springs from that, but in the third year sow and reap, plant vineyards and eat from their fruit. Now let me just explain that. God has sent a message to the wicked king and said, you, you threaten me, you sneer at me, you insult me. You say you're so powerful, you, you can even stop up the Nile. You're such a remarkably powerful individual. How dare you? And then God turns to the little king Hezekiah and says, you know what? Don't worry about this guy. You're going to plant and reap this season and next season and the third season. It's going to be just fine. Nobody's moving out of town. Nobody's being shipped out to another country. You're going to plant and reap right here in your own area. Once more, the remnant of the house of Judah will take root below and bear fruit above. For out of Jerusalem will come a remnant, and out of Mount Zion, a band of survivors. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. He's telling Hezekiah, Hezekiah, don't you worry. Don't you worry, buddy. You're going to plant, you're going to reap. Don't be planning for war here. There isn't going to be a war. I'm going to put such a spirit of fear into this king that he'll turn and run. You watch and see what I do. Therefore, this is what the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria. He will not enter the city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come down with a shield or build a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, he will return. He will not enter this city, declares the Lord. I will defend the city and save it for, the sake, for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. That night, the angel of the Lord, and by the way, it's not an angel from the Lord. The word the appears in there, the angel of the Lord. This is an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. Consider how big that army was that they could lose 185,000 men in one night. When the people got up the next morning, they were all, they were all dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. One day, while he was worshiping in the temple of his god, Nishroch, his sons, Adrimelech and Shalazar, cut him down with a sword, and they escaped to the land of Ararat, and Eshkelon, his son, succeeded him as king. All of this came down to this. Whatever you do, don't trust your God. Whatever you do, don't take a stance of faith. Don't you dare believe that God is able. Because what God has ever been able? But they were messing with the wrong God. 
They were messing with the God of the Bible. And he turned around. He sent one angel down who killed 185,000 of those Assyrian troops in one night. And the rest of them got up the next morning, saw only dead bodies. They broke camp and they ran like scared kittens out of town and back to the place they came from. God delivered exactly as he said he would. Take strength. Be encouraged. Know that God is able. No matter what the realists say, no matter what the scientists say, no matter what the wise men say, trust in the Lord your God. Depend on him. He is able. Good King Hezekiah would take sick. And the prophet would come in and tell him that he was going to die. Set his house in order. And Hezekiah begged the Lord once more. And the prophet, before he left the palace, turned around, came back and said, God has heard your prayer and seen your tears. He's going to give you 15 more years. Believe it or not, this was an unfortunate thing because in that time, he would bear a son by the name of Manasseh. And Manasseh would become perhaps the most wicked of kings ever. It's believed that Manasseh is the one that sawed Isaiah in half while he hid in a tree. Had he died when God had told him his number was up, the whole story would have ended much differently. But Hezekiah was a good man and a good king, and he trusted the Lord, and the Lord extended his life. We don't know why people are taken out when they're taken out. But we do know God knows the future. We do know God knows what he's doing. And we need to trust him, depend upon him, and serve him with all our heart, all our soul, and all our strength. For one day, we will meet him. Will you bow your heads? Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I've read these very long passages to make the point that we are to depend upon you, to trust in you, and that there will always be the naysayers. There will always be those that come along and want you to see reason the way they see reason. But our reason is not their reason. Our way is not their way. We depend on what the Word of God says. Not on the reasoning of the world, or the intelligence of the world, but on the reasoning of our living God. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.